Now, there's a couple other things I don't really agree with. One, GFO. Now, I will say it works incredibly, and I do have a container, but I use it as a tool for a specific job. If my phosphate gets up to like 1.5, 2.0, honestly, it still don't really bother me. 2.0 is pretty bad. But if I see if it gets that high and I see a negative impact on my corals, I'll want to bring it down pretty quick. And that's what I would use GFO for, a rapid reduction of phosphates because I think the phosphates are killing my corals because they're extremely high. That being said, because when I use GFO, I see a negative impact on my corals from the GFO being in the water column. Corals hate GFO. Now, if you have a big system, use a small amount, you'll probably never notice it. But I'm telling you, they do not like it. So, if you do use GFO, use a very small amount. It will be my last resort. Now, that's going to lead me into carbon dosing. If I feel like my phosphate's too high, or my nitrate's too high, like over 70, 80, I would, and I wanted, then I would want to bring my nutrients down, I would look to carbon dosing. Now, mind you, my nitrate would have to be super high, like 75, 80, and I would have to see a negative impact on my corals. I will not do it just because the numbers are high. I would only do it if I think the corals are being negatively impacted from it being high. Then I would carbon dose. Now the way carbon dosing works, and I just recently found this out, carbon dosing is very slow. It's not a fast reduction. But again, you don't want a fast reduction. That's another reason GFO hurts your corals. It does it very efficiently and too fast. Now carbon dosing, you pick a carbon source, Regular vinegar is probably the best, where you can get vodka, Everclear, sugar, any kind of carbon. You can even use a combination, because every carbon source targets a different bacteria, from my reading. So I use vodka and vinegar. Now, the way it works is, you dump the carbon in your tank. The bacteria eats the carbon source, causing your bacteria to multiply like crazy. And now, it's an easy way to know if you did too much. If you do too much too fast, your water will get cloudy with bacteria, which is not bad. Your corals will like that. If you're worried about some carbon or something in there, take it out. Activated carbon. Skimmer will take it out, probably better because it's bacteria. But you'll get like a thin white layer on your glass. The water will get cloudy. That's if you're doing it too much. But that's still not a negative thing that's going to hurt your corals. So dump the carbon in, feed your bacteria. Your bacteria multiply. But as they multiply, they are consuming your phosphates. So if you want to reduce your nitrate, you have to have phosphate in your water. And if you don't, dose Make sure you put phosphate in your water. Dose it. Because the bacteria needs phosphate to multiply. And that's how it reduces your phosphate levels. Bacteria consume it. Now bacteria are not very good at consuming nitrate. Only phosphate. Then you got this abundance of bacteria in your water column. And then your corals eat that. The food source for your corals. The corals start housing all the bacteria. They start getting comfier, happier, and they start growing faster. Now your corals are excellent at removing nitrate from the water column. Again, corals love nitrate. Your bacteria loves phosphate. But corals need phosphate too. They get it from the bacteria they consume. So as they consume this bacteria, the corals will grow and remove the nitrate from the water column. That's kind of how it works. So it's not an overnight solution. 
When you carbon dose, it could take a week or two to see any reduction, depending on how aggressive you are. So I would dose like vodka and vinegar at the same time, two carbon sources to target multiple bacteria sources. That's the goal. There's zero phosphate, add phosphate. Bacteria consume that. Corals consume the bacteria. They grow and they remove the nitrate from the water column. It's all done properly. It'll reduce your nutrients. So again, you gotta make sure your phosphate don't hit zero because the carbon source directly reduces your phosphate. The nitrate is more of a secondary factor, but it will reduce your nitrate as well. But you, you'd probably expect to see a reduction in your phosphate before a reduction in your nitrate. So make sure it don't bottom out. But that is the safest way to reduce your nutrients. And your corals love it. As soon as you start putting that carbon in there, and the bacteria starts multiplying, your corals will get happy. You put GFO in there, and your corals get a little taste of that. They will get unhappy. So, just want to shed some light on that. That's how I do that. One other thing, man, I still gotta get in this sonic experiment one day because that's game changing, especially if you use the uh, CO2 absorbing media. It would only last me like three days, or this makes it last like three weeks. Now, let's see if I can get in there. I can't. You have a stinky skimmer, throw a bag of carbon over the top. That helps get the smell out of the room. Now, this right here. I zip. This is plastic tubing for, like, airline hoses. I guess, like, a brine shrimp hatchery or something. Some fish stores have it, not BRS or saltwateraquarium.com would have this tiny plastic tubing. But I cut a short piece and I zip tie it on there with two zip ties. Enough where I can turn it. And that's my filter cell cord. You pick it straight up, and it comes off. Go back up. And you just turn it to the side and hook it. So if you want to use a tank that don't have filter sock holders, you can hang it on your downspout. I've done that for a long time. It works great. One more thing I want to stress. There is no magic for algae. Everybody has it. Every cor coral dealer has it. So you're going to get it. There's no way around it. The ocean has it. And the ocean don't have a magic trick for it. I never touch algae in this tank. Now, it's easy to do with a small tank. Because the trick is herbivores. There's no bottled chemicals that are going to help you. If anything, they're gonna, they might help instantly. But then like a week or so later, you're going to have negative side effects. The ocean uses herbivores. If it did not have sea urchins, which are number one in my opinion, they can be a pain, but they're number one for cleaning your tank. They grind the hard stuff off the rocks that your snails and fish don't like. That also spreads coralline algae in my opinion. If you want more coralline algae, scrape it, because then the small pieces go everywhere. And it spreads. Oh my gosh, this tank has coralline everywhere. You see, everywhere I don't scrape it, there's just coralline, coralline, coralline. Even the skimmer's purple inside the coralline. So you scrape it, it multiplies. But if the ocean didn't have herbivores, the algae would grow and it would consume the corals and the corals would die. But it has a balanced set of herbivores. It has snails, urchins, and fish.
I don't have a single herbivorous fish, except for maybe the diamond goby. He would probably take a couple pecks at some algae. My tanks are too small. I wouldn't even put a tang in that 125 gallon tank. I think it's too small for a big fish. I used to grow koi fish, so I know a thing or two about big fish. So I would highly stress to you, just get snails and sea urchins. The Astria snails, the cone-shaped ones, they're like a little spiral. Those are the best ones for crawling up in your frag rack and cleaning your frags. Getting all up on the edges of your corals, getting in the little nooks and crannies. The big turbo snails are... Oh, they're, they're the second best. They're good for just mowing down the hard stuff. They'll get the bulk of it, and then the astrias will come behind them and get the detailed work. Sea urchins only put the algae on their head or shells, corals, whatever they can find. It's weird. They make 3D printed hats on Etsy. I don't have Etsy. I wish I had one. A little Viking helmet or cowboy hat. They make them. Every tank has a sea urchin. There's an Astria snail. Oh, there's Diamond Goby. There's I guess snails everywhere. There's a big one back there. Big one cleaning the corals. He must be running out of food, so he's starting to clean the corals on their little ones too. There's beautiful fish. Oh, he got us. Oh, he did. I would never suggest anybody get a long spine sea urchin. Where's he at? He's back in the box. Those tend to eat corals sometimes. This one's doing pretty good so far. The last one I had loved to eat leptosiris. Starfish love to eat leptosiris. Starfish and long spine sea urchins are not necessarily coral safe. Now, in my opinion, they will only eat a couple of your hard corals, your SPS corals, and they'll find like one specific one and they'll only eat that one. And if you feed them, they won't do that. So if you keep them fat and happy, they won't touch your corals. But those ones are dangerous. But there's no magic trick for algae. You, you see algae? Number one, you gotta get in there and pull as much out with your hand. Then get in there with a toothbrush and scrub the rest. I keep this little scrub bucket. You know, I get in there, pull out my fingers, I go in there, and scrub it with a toothbrush, even the frag plugs. And if there's too much crap floating around, I'll use a net to get it out. Turkey baster is awesome. You get in there and you blast some crap. Watch this. Look at that. See? If you don't blow that off, that crap will turn. It'll turn into algae. Now, when you get sea urchins, you'll get a lot more of this white dust just from them grinding shit. Like, and now that, I won't even wipe that out. There's enough flow, it'll stay suspended, and the filter sock can get it. A little mini hurricane. That's covered in bacteria. Coral's gonna like that little spray. A long spine sea urchin, <clears throat> it keeps eating the stalk of this frog spawn. It's like a toothpick. I'm gonna have to pull it out or he's gonna eat him. You just gotta clean as much as you can and throw herbivores in. Now, in my experience, if you have zero or very low nutrients, nitrate and phosphate, more specifically the nitrate part, your tank will be dirty with algae. Now, if you get higher nitrate with a little bit of phosphate, your tank will be cleaner. 
your nitrate level, your phosphate always has to be very detectable. But your nitrate level dictates the cleanliness of your tank. My only opinion on it is, is that is a very, that's an observation that I can't get around. Higher nitrate, the cleaner the tank. Lower nitrate, the dirtier the tank with algae. I'm guessing the higher nitrate boosts up your ecology and your bacteria. All your little critters start getting happier and start multiplying and they help consume the algae. I'm not sure. But a dirtier tank, nutrient wise, tends to be a cleaner tank, algae wise. Don't be scared to get them nutrients up. Now, if you have an Acropora dominated tank, you, you might want to keep the nitrate lower. Still want detectable phosphate. But where like LPS and most of my corals, I like my nitrate 15 to 30. SPS, I'd probably be happy with 5 to 15. Probably more on the lower end. Thank <laughs> you.